Hello, the head of the CIA has told the BBC he has every expectation that Russia will try to interfere in the American midterm elections this November. In his first international interview, Mike Pompeo suggested too that North Korea would have the ability to deliver a nuclear weapon to the United States in a handful of months. A Trump ally, a former congressman from the Tea Party wing of the Republican Party, he also strongly defended the president. He sat down with our security correspondent, Gordon Carrera. It is one of the most famous and yet secret buildings in the world, the headquarters of the Central Intelligence Agency. Everyone's seen this, it's in all the movies. Showing me round is Mike Pompeo, who's just marked a year as its head, a tumultuous time around the world and in Washington. He's not shy about the CIA's mission, saying he's unleashed the agency to take more risks. We're the world's finest espionage service. I'm incredibly proud of that. Uh, we're going to go out there and do our damnedest to steal secrets uh, on behalf of the American people. In the room where America's most secret operations are planned, I asked him about Russia and the claims it interfered in America's last election, as well as in Europe. Do you see signs that Russian activity is lessening in terms of subversion in Europe and the United States? I haven't seen a significant decrease in their activity. Do you have concerns that they might try and interfere in the U.S. midterms which are coming up? Of course. Uh, I have every expectation that they will continue to try and do that. But I'm confident that America will be able to have a free and fair election that will push back in a way that is sufficiently robust that the impact, that the impact they have on our election won't, uh, won't be great. Do you ever find yourself having to walk a fine line with a president who has said that talk about Russian particularly collusion is fake news and an agency which has said that there were attempts in 2016 to influence the election? I don't do fine lines. <laughs> I do the truth. Uh, I, we deliver uh, nearly every day uh, personally uh, to the president the most exquisite truth that we know. A recent book of which I'm sure you're aware suggested that the president wasn't quite up to it, that he might uh, not quite have the faculties. What's your response to that as someone who sits in the room with any mornings? Yeah, it's absurd. The claim that the president isn't engaged and doesn't have a grasp on these important issues is dangerous and false and uh, it saddens me that someone would have taken the time to write such a dribble. Is it tricky for you though when you've been in these briefings and then you might come out and there might be some tweet about a foreign policy issue? I mean when the president talks about rocket man isn't there a, a danger that it's raising the temperature with something like North Korea and it could could actually lead to some kind of escalation? Kim Jong-un has never appreciated the risk that he presents to the world in the way that he does today and so when you see this language that the president chooses to use, the many audiences for it, and I can share with your audience today that I assure you Kim Jong-un understands the message that America is serious about this. The CIA director says that his job is to find other ways of stopping America being at risk from a nuclear-armed North Korea should diplomacy fail. Are there options that are available do you think that are short of all-out war because a lot of people think that that option would cause massive destruction and loss of life. Well they're right about that. Uh, there, there is a uh, set of military tasks that might have to be undertaken and they would in fact cause enormous damage and uh, our president and our senior leaders are very mindful of that. How much time do you think there is because some in the past I think people have talked about it being an imminent threat. We talk about him having the ability to deliver a nuclear weapon uh, to the United States in a matter of a handful of months. Stopping attacks and stealing secrets is the CIA's mission. The stars on this wall mark those who died carrying it out. The way in which the agency has gone about its work has always reflected the president it serves. And Donald Trump's CIA under Mike Pompeo will be an agency that won't hold back, wherever that might take it. Gordon Carrera, BBC News, Langley, Virginia. The Deputy Director of the FBI, Andrew McCabe, is stepping down even though he was due to retire within weeks. He's been the focus of intense criticism from President Trump and his Republican allies for what they claim is political bias towards Hillary Clinton. From FBI headquarters in Washington, our North America editor John Sopel explained how much political pressure Andrew McCabe has been under. On one level you can say, what's the big deal, Andrew McCabe, he was due to retire in March, he's gone a few weeks early, does it really matter? 
Well, yes, it does, because he had been under sustained pressure and attack from Donald Trump because the president thought he was partisan, pro-Democrat. His wife had stood for the state Senate in Virginia. And, of course, this comes after the firing of the FBI director, James Comey. And it looks now that Mr. McCabe has gone under pressure. Now, what the reaction is to this depends whether you're a Democrat or Republican. The Democrats are saying this is a sustained assault on the independence of the FBI and the Justice Department uh, in an attempt to undermine the Russia investigation that we were just hearing about. Republicans are saying the Russia investigation is deeply flawed, that there is bias in the FBI, and they're calling for the release of this, this very controversial memo written by the House uh, Chairman of the Intelligence Committee, which is reported to allege that there is corruption in the Mueller investigation. There are plenty of allegations and very few facts, apart from the one that Mr. McCabe stood down today. John Sopal in Washington, D.C. After years of debate, the Irish government has agreed to a referendum at the end of May on whether to reform the country's strict abortion laws. It has long been a hugely contentious issue. The Republic has a near total ban on terminating pregnancies, except when doctors consider a woman's health is at risk. Andrew Plant reports. We say pro it is an issue that polarizes opinion in Ireland, now set to be the subject of a referendum on changing the law. At the moment, Ireland has a near total ban on abortion, even when a pregnancy is the result of rape or incest, or if a fetus has no chance of survival. At the moment, thousands of women travel overseas to terminate their pregnancy every year, or buy abortion pills online, taken at home, without medical support or supervision. Now politicians have agreed to hold a referendum on whether the laws on abortion should be changed. We already have abortion in Ireland, but it's unsafe, unregulated and unlawful. And in my opinion, we cannot continue to export our problems and import our solutions. As Taoiseach, as a medical doctor, as a former Minister for Health, I don't believe we can persist with a situation whereby women in crisis are risking their lives through the use of unregulated medicines. Pro-life groups here believe the laws on abortion shouldn't be changed, but campaigners want to see it decriminalised and polls suggest that most people would vote to change the law and make abortion legal in some circumstances. Now Ireland's health minister will draft a bill to amend the country's constitution in time for a vote at the end of May. Andrew Plant, BBC News. Ministers from the 27 states, which will still be members of the European Union after Brexit, have agreed their negotiating guidelines for a transitional agreement with the UK. And crucially, during that transition, the UK will have to obey the rules of the single market and the customs union, but will have no voting rights. Our Europe editor Katja Adler reports from Brussels. Brexit is back on the Brussels agenda after a long-ish winter break. Today, ministers from the 27 EU countries came here to agree guidelines for the transition phase to follow immediately after Brexit. Aware of political volatility back in London... Do you worry about the fragility of the UK government? ...though clearly not keen to talk about it. The ministers are only giving themselves 10 minutes in there to agree EU guidelines for transition negotiations. It's a very public display of EU unity. In stark contrast, they know to what's going on in the UK. Still speaking today to a House of Lords committee, the Brexit secretary appeared relaxed about the transition period at least. It, it, it's pretty clear. We want a high degree of stability. We want the right to do deals outside. Um, uh, broadly, that's it. Um, and we will ideally we want some control over our own destiny in terms of the uh, uh, in terms of any subsequent legislation. It's pretty simple, really. But is it? Mr. Davis was speaking in London at the same time as his European counterpart took to the podium in Brussels. And he made it plain that the transition period would transfer the UK from rule maker to rule taker. During the transition period, if decisions are taken by the EU27, um, which are not acceptable to the United Kingdom, what action can the UK government take? 
The UK asked for this transition period, giving it full access to the single market, to provide stability for business. We're agreeing to that, but to benefit from the single market, the UK has to accept our rules. Single market à la carte is just not possible. Mr Barnier said the UK would have to respect rulings by the European Court of Justice and would not be allowed to enter into new trade deals with other countries. And there are more possible flashpoints. Duration. The EU says the transition should last a total of 21 months. The UK may want more time. Freedom of movement. Brussels insists EU citizens have the right to move to the UK and apply for permanent residency throughout the transition period. Observer status. The UK will have to pay into the EU budget during transition and observe all EU regulations, though it will no longer be a decision maker. In all the fraught Brexit negotiations, this was supposed to be the easy part. After all, the UK requested a transition period from the EU. So, the warning here now is if talks get too tricky over transition, that could eat into the precious time left under EU law to discuss EU-UK future trade relations before the UK leaves the bloc in March 2019. The message from here, once again, is the ball is in the UK's court. Cathy Adler, BBC News, Brussels. Much more to come on BBC News, including this. The State of the Union's infrastructure as President Trump prepares to deliver his major speech, which size up the task of fixing America's bridges and roads. Very good to have you with us on BBC News. The latest headlines. The head of the CIA has been telling the BBC about the threat from Russia in this year's midterm elections and defending President Trump's mental faculties. After years of argument, the Irish government has agreed to a referendum at the end of May on whether to reform the Republic's near total ban on abortion. After years of talks between the Vatican and Beijing about who runs the Roman Catholic Church in China, details are emerging about a possible deal. The authorities want all unregistered congregations to join the state-approved official church, and they want the right to appoint bishops. The Pope seems willing to consider these demands, and that's drawing criticism from China's most respected cleric. David Campanale reports. Unregistered church congregations like this one are a thorn in the side of China's Communist Party. The church is Roman Catholic, but there are many like it which are independent and Protestant. Accurate figures are hard to come by, but if Christianity and all its traditions continues growing at current rates, by 2030, the Chinese church could become the biggest in the world. Now the authorities are moving to assert control. Priests and bishops in the so-called underground Catholic Church are appointed by Rome, but they face persecution for not complying with communist demands. From Thursday, Chinese law requires all unregistered churches to become one of these, an official Catholic Church. In a visit to China widely reported across Catholic media, Vatican asked two of their own bishops to resign or accept demotion in favor of Beijing appointed leaders. They haven't done so yet. But in the struggle between Christianity and communism, the Vatican expects to win out in the end. The goal of Pope Francis is a majority church. He, he wants the stake and the stake is all China because as we assist at a lack of values in China uh, as a consequence of the uh, economic development, he knows that uh, the uh, rule class, the rule class, the leadership in China will need uh, religion. But the idea of compromise has outraged former Bishop of Hong Kong, Cardinal Zen. He went to Rome to plead with the Pope not to submit to communism handing over a letter appealing for a different approach. He's also taken to his blog, saying, Do I think that the Vatican is selling out the Catholic Church in China? Yes, definitely, if they go in the direction which is obvious from all they've been doing in recent years and months. During Hong Kong's democracy protests, Cardinal Zen has already shown he can be outspoken. 
He's now promised to be an obstacle to China and the Vatican reach ill. David Campanale, BBC News. We should just tell you the BBC did ask the Vatican to respond to Cardinal Zen. It so far declined to do so. South Africa's second largest city, Cape Town, is in the midst of a severe drought. Residents are being limited to 50 litres of water a day. If the authorities turn the taps off entirely, they are talking of a so-called day zero in early April. Cape Town will be the first major city in the world to run dry. Andrew Harding reports. Glorious Cape Town. The most idyllic, the most pampered corner of an entire continent. Until now. Suddenly, a city of four million people is running out of water at alarming speed. As rationing begins, there are queues for spring water. It's a bit scary and uncertain, and based on the experience of filling up here, it's um, intimidating about what's to come. Here's the problem. The reservoirs Cape Town depends on are parched after three years of a drought no one predicted. The experts blame climate change, hotter temperatures, erratic rainfall. We really are, you know, the canary in the cage at the moment. So all of these predictions that are being made about the impacts of climate change are, are happening. They're happening now um, to us here before our eyes in, in, all around the world. In a panic, the city is drilling for water. Tapping into rainfall that seeped underground a million years ago. But the process is slow and time is short. And so, Cape Tonians of all stripes are preparing for the worst. There is a real sense of anxiety here as people count down to day zero, waiting for the moment when all the taps are switched off and everyone is forced to queue in places like this for their daily ration of water. In the meantime, many here are embracing the challenge, posting water-saving tips online. Seven litres per shower to three litres. Impressively, the city has nearly halved its water consumption. There you go. We are in this together. And we have to build a sense of one nation with one future where everybody needs to get decent basic services and that we all need to pull together to make sure that everybody gets them all the time. Next mercy is for winning. But some people aren't playing along. We join the police as they hunt for Cape Town's newest outlaws. Car washers. Buckets and sponges are confiscated, fines handed out. As a thirsty city fights for every last drop of water and waits to see if those tantalizing clouds on Table Mountain will finally oblige. Andrew Harding, BBC News, Cape Town. On Tuesday, President Trump will deliver the annual State of the Union address. He's expected to emphasize his plan to rebuild America's infrastructure. He has already made it clear he wants private investors to fund much of it, and that is not going down well with Democrats, who say the federal government should pay more. Jenna Bryan's been looking at the daunting task ahead. Daybreak in the nation's capital, and already traffic is grinding to a halt on one of the busiest bridges into the city. This bridge is clearly struggling to deal with the volume of traffic. Is that typical? This is typical of our entire network. Our infrastructure, our transportation network is failing to meet the needs of our communities. Christina Swallow is president of the American Society of Civil Engineers, which rates the nation's infrastructure every four years. The current grade is D+. If we don't invest in our infrastructure, it will cost the U.S. economy $3.9 trillion in GDP by 2025. 7 trillion lost in business sales in that same time frame, and 2.5 million lost jobs. This will hurt our economy and it hurts us each individually. President Trump wants to focus on infrastructure this year, and some areas need urgent attention. A broken water main at New York's JFK International Airport compounded the effects of a winter storm early January, causing chaos and additional flight cancellations. U.S. airports serve more than two million passengers a day, but buildings and systems aren't keeping pace, and aviation gets a D. Traffic delays cost the U.S. economy an estimated $160 billion a year in wasted time and fuel. One in five miles of highway is in poor condition. Roads 
also score a D. Even worse is public transit. Despite an increase in demand, chronic underfunding has left an aging infrastructure and a $90 billion improvement backlog. D minus. When you own your home, the last thing you really want to do is pay for that, that roof um, until water starts coming in and then you realize that you have no choice. And so I think that's what America's done. We have kept just putting band-aids and temporary fixes on our infrastructure system and we've just done that for decades and we are now seeing the results. Washington is doing slightly better than the U.S. as a whole with a score of C-. minus. The Frederick Douglass Memorial Bridge is almost 70 years old and in urgent need of replacement. The estimated cost of the new structure is $441 million, but city planners say the project will create 1,300 jobs and boost the economy. President Trump wants to invest a trillion dollars in the nation's infrastructure and speed things up by cutting the time to process permits. But exactly who will pay remains an open question. And the one thing the president really needs is already in short supply. Cooperation from Democrats. Everybody agrees the problem is urgent, but much like America's roads, getting from A to B could be a bumpy ride. Jane O'Brien, BBC News, Washington. More on that in less than 24 hours now. A mural by the graffiti artist Banksy has been granted a new lease of life in the British city of Hull. But only just, the piece was defaced on Sunday night with whitewash and a window cleaner was just one of the art-loving locals who helped save it, gathering up his equipment and heading out to help. Our correspondent Danny Savage went to meet him. It appeared last week on an old bridge in Hull, a Banksy mural of a child carrying a wooden sword with a pencil attached to the end. People flocked to see it, but then it all went wrong. Last night it was vandalised until a few weeks ago Hull was the UK city of culture, but somebody took exception to this piece of culture. It was painted over and potentially ruined, but before it dried, volunteers turned up to uncover it. They included window cleaner Jason Fanthorpe, armed with some ladders and white spirit. He was back at work today, being modest about his achievements. You can't drag your reputation of an entire city by, you know, one act of vandalism. And the, the fact that so many people pulled together as a community, it just shows that, you know, people are better than that. Now a plastic screen has been put over it for protection. I just think it's a shame that Hull, having been the city of culture of last year, have we learned nothing, you know, the fact that we're now having to protect something that's art. Banksy is, is renowned for his, his um, messages that he shares with people. I think it's, look at all these people, it's brilliant. Those who saved this Banksy say it's a gift to the city and it must be looked after. Danny Savage, BBC News, Hull. Just finally, it looks like a scene from a James Bond movie, but this is a real mission in Austria to rescue 150 skiers from a broken chairlift. It's a delicate and dangerous mission. Helicopters had to hover above the cables on the side of Kreisberg Mountain. And just like in the movies, it was successful. It supported none of the stranded skiers had any injuries. More on that, more on all the news, anytime on the BBC website. You can reach me and most of the team on Twitter. I'm at BBC Mike Embley. Thank you very much for watching.